Thanks, Rachel and Melissa, for inviting me to this great session. Um, I, I was, uh, I really enjoyed the, the previous two talks from Christine and Will. They're, it's an incredible perspective. I love having this translational type of uh, um, session at the meeting and just seeing the front lines, of, that they're on the front lines with um, trying to use the omics data and all the analysis that's coming out um, for patient care. Um, I don't really need to go over this. You've all seen many different cases, and, but I wanted to, but I'm gonna show um, some analysis for this particular patient. So just to walk you through it, it's a, a, you know, a typical metastatic prostate cancer patient um, that, that walks into a doctor's office, um, got a first line of therapy. So in prostate cancer, it's driven by, uh, by androgen, testosterone, and the, and the prostate tissue is wired up to, to proliferate when the androgen receptor binds that ligand. And so uh, the first type of treatment is to shut down the, the testosterone in the body. And that works for a while. And then there's um, you know, recurrence, and they measure uh, prostate serum albumin, this PSA, to try to track the, the tumor's growth, right? Not the perfect type of indicator, but an indicator nonetheless. And for, this, for these metastatic patients, sure enough, the, they resist the first line of treatment. And then they'll get some other treatment still, in this case, aimed at androgen. So abiraterone sort of blocks uh, the, the uh, um, uh, you know, the ho it blocks um, hormone synthesis, so uh, almost all hormone synthesis, by the way, so they'll get this treatment, then they need to get supplemental hormone, which makes you start thinking, what leads to the next round of resistance, right? It could be they have other growth receptors that are responding to the supplemental hormones that they get and so on. And then uh, for this particular patient, they even recur, they recur on that, maybe due to some of these other types of of alternate responses, and they get another androgen type of blocker, this time enzalutamide they're being considered for, and this one actually blocks the receptor now, right? So this is sort of a typical situation. And then in, um, in, in some work that I'm involved in, in the, in the Stand Up to Cancer and Prostate Cancer Foundation, the biopsies are taken from where they, where they detect met metastatic disease, and then they go through a panel through the, uh, of of assays through the pathology report. So, you know, proliferative markers like keratin, or they look for, in this case, a small cell or what they call a neuroendocrine phenotype by staining chromatogranin. So this particular patient shows a subtype like that. Um, the androgen receptor is not really amplified anymore in the METs, and, and then they're not detecting PSA, for example. So I, I just wanted to go over that. And when, you know, we're sort of handed the, the data then um, that's collected, a lot of, a lot of um, NGS types of data like RNA sequencing, exome sequencing, and so on. And, and we're, we're asked as informatics uh, uh, specialists, what, what, do you, what can you do for this patient, right? Interpret that, that sequence, that RNA sequence, uh, or the mutations that we found, and tell us what therapy to give. And you're sort of presented with this N equal one case. Everybody's talking about the N of one. Well, you know, we're, a lot of us are statisticians and there's no power with N equal one. And, and so what do you do? Um, and, and do you actually pay attention to all these details um, from, their, from these case histories and which ones are important and which ones uh, aren't as important um, for selecting the therapy? Like I mentioned, they had supplemental hormone therapy. Is that, is that actually important? So uh, the, I don't know if this is a solution, but one way to, that we're approaching this uh, subject is to try to uh, drape onto a background of lots of other analysis that, that's been collected, and I'll show examples with the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. Or, I, I mean, I love this study. Will talked about the basic study where they take all comers and you have lots of patients that you're looking at, and you have this tapestry of of, of ge genomics data that you can sort of consult for this particular patient. And then the challenge is trying to match up the best kind of avatar you have in your database with this patient, and then maybe um, tweak on the themes that you identify. Um, and so that'll kind of be the theme of this talk. And I don't know if it's the, uh, it, it's not, it's certainly not the only way to do it, but it's, it's, it's what we have right now, and we can, we can actually approach it this way as informatics folks. So, the one slide overview really of TCGA, I think most people know what it is, but we're collecting about 25 different um, 
tumor types. Um, some of them are rare cancers. I think we need to expand in that angle. This is all um, primary disease, and maybe a focus later will be to get uh, metastatic uh, samples characterized and so on. Um, and then they're characterized at, at many different centers um, with um, genome uh, sequencing, both exome and then 10% get whole genome, and uh, RNA sequencing, microRNA sequencing, and um, some co uh, copy number chips, um, methylation chips. Um, that's TCJ. So many different hands studying the same uh, disease process. And uh, when, when you uh, start anal get, you know, when, you, when somebody drops into your lap all these types of data, of course, it's can, it can be overwhelming. Um, and there's, you know, a combinatorial number of ways to compare these data sets, right? That goes up by a power law. Um, the, the number of uh, different data types you have, you're, you have exponentially different number of ways to use it. And you can find, uh, you know, yourself thinking about, well, uh, what do I do with that data too? What genes are on or off? And you've got all these different types of data to use and you can feel like you're at, in front of the stop sign. I don't know where the stop sign is, um, uh, but I mean the stoplight, but you know, are you supposed to cross the street or not, right? <laughs> um, and so you need, uh, you need some way of interpreting this data, some, something that tells you what, whether, a, let's say, a gene or a pathway is active or not. Uh, so uh, the particular approach that uh, we take in the lab and a lot of others, um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here, is to uh, utilize what we know about genetic circuits and um, how they uh, signal to each other. And this is a graph I stole from the first TCJ manuscript that Larry Donahauer made. Um, and you can, and the take-home message here that was uh, somewhat inspiring for me was that even though every patient's got a different type of alteration in this glioblastoma, that, uh, that you can see um, if you look from the perspective of pathways, uh, um, those, those mutations tell you a story and there's a theme. And so, um, you know, almost all of the GBMs, 87%, had some problem in P53 signaling. They could have had uh, an amplification of the inhibitor, or they could have actually had a deleterious knockout, a mutation in the P53 tumor suppressor, but they all lead to problems in apoptosis and senescence. And so you can kind of look around at the hallmarks of cancer in this kind of sense and, and see, and, and try to make sense of, of what's going on in, in, the, in the tumors. So a pathway-based perspective is great to have. And, um, uh, folks like uh, Chris Sander at Sloan Kettering um, have done a great job collecting all these um, pathway resources from the literature and other places and, to, uh, and compiled them that, and, into a way that's useful um, for analysis. Now, of course, uh, Larry Hunter loves to call, if you collect all of the interaction data, right, he calls this the radiculome the, or the hairball. Um, and uh, it's terrible for, for human beings, right? I mean, if you show this thing to biologists, I'm always shocked that even a, a biologist who studied, um, you know, made their life's work out of um, describing a particular process in the cell, they may not even appreciate all the different interconnections that their own lab found, um, that just how complicated it is. Um, luckily, uh, computers love this stuff, right? And we can just sort of hand off these representations to a computer uh, and then use techniques that, you know, we, you know, we saw, if you go to Donna Pear's um, uh, Overton lecture, she was one of the pioneers in this. You can take these graphical models, uh, use a quantitative part to it, and then help it kind of chug through the data and tell you, and try to focus in on where the themes are. Um, and uh, hopefully you can gain some insights on what has gone wrong in a particular tumor type. Uh, so my lab has also developed some of these methods um, based on, you know, the early work from uh, folks like Donna and um, Aran C. Gal and Daphne Collar and, and Nir Friedman. Actually, Nir wrote a nice article in Science, I think it's 10 years ago now, uh, describing the uses of these types of models for bioinformatics. And so then you can take a, a several different types of data, uh, integrate it onto a pathway model, and then sort of compress this data, right? This was all those different stoplights staring at us and sort of try to interpret it from the pathway perspective and now have one matrix of patients by activated pathways or complexes or processes that you can use. Downstream analyses can use them for machine learning or learning about, about patients and so on. 
So our model is called Paradigm, and the, um, the uh, one contribution, I guess, the major one of Paradigm is it sort of unrolls out the, the central dogma so you can drape in different parts of your measurements about genes into um, one uh, activity of that, of that protein that the gene, um, uh, of the gene product. And then uh, link together the genes by their regulatory logic um, from the collections like Pathway Commons. And then um, let the, let the um, graphical model do belief propagation and then, try, and then make inferences um, about the activity of different components of this whole big, huge graphical model. Uh, and so the first time we ran this on the ovarian cancer data set, this was the second tumor type analyzed by, by the TCJ project. The um, model sort of honed in on this FOXM1 uh, mitotic regulator, um, which was, uh, it's a pretty well-known pathway in cancer. It's a, you know, as I said, it, it, it regula it's a transcription factor that's sort of a central regulator of mitosis. Um, and so this is one of those cases where they said, well, show us something we don't know. Uh, they, I don't think they appreciated it really that much in ovarian cancer particularly. But, the, but one of the interesting things with FOXM1 was it's got two isoforms um, and one sort of promotes cell cycle progression and the other one sort of feeds through, you know, the BRCA genes and, and, um, and uh, regulates DNA repair. And, it, and, and so, and FOXM1 itself is actually uh, downstream of all these repair uh, these these um, processes that detect damaged DNA, like ATM and ATR, and so it's it's sort of an interesting story that you're getting about the about these ovarian tumors that have lots of copy number changes and they need lots of repair to happen, and then the components like FOXM1 may be getting upregulated but not being spliced correctly, and so then you can imagine the type of crosstalk that might be happening in these tumors. So. Uh, Myself and, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, Chris Sander and, and Ilya Shmulevich uh, co-led a, um, uh, a bit of work from TCJ called the Pan Cancer Project, where we, where we decided to collect all the data together, to, like, this, like the, the type of um, study that, that, Bill's doing with the base, that Will's doing with the basic study, um, to look at all the different tumors we had at that point in TCJ and build a library of signatures and look for patterns and so on. And, the, I think the concept we had in the beginning was, you know, we could, by putting all these things together, we could define a new molecular taxonomy based on the pathways that were misregulated in these tumors. And I think to some part, we, we, we did manage to do that. And then you could imagine, you know, taking a patient and looking it up on this, on this hierarchy. Um, and uh, this was a, a, a large amount of work from, from many folks. And I just wanted to summarize it quickly to give you a background of, uh, of what we can do for for the n equal one case, so um, some of the results that came out of this work from Gaddy Getz's group, we um, could look at just the, the frequency of tumors and the mutation spectrum again, and see you know melanomas obviously have the highest amount, um, and they show the UV signatures of mutations and so on, um, and then some of the head and neck squamous, like Christine was talking about, also very mutation driven, and then on the other end of the spectrum, some of the leukemias um, you know are, are less uh, mutation driven. Um, and, and this um, sort of tells us something about the processes in these tumors. Um, uh, you know, other work followed on those signatures to show certain enzymes like APOBEC um, leave telltale signatures um, in, in the genome as well, which is a very interesting story um, from, the, from the Stratton group. Um, and then Gaddy's uh, group could also take a look at this and correlate it with other aspects of the tumors. And, and they noticed, just like in 1,000 genomes, that genes near late replication forks tend to have more mutations. Uh, well, why that is, um, I think, is still up for debate. Maybe the nucleotide pool is running out at that point, and so it's just more slop that happens at those genes. Um, and also, um, you know, you could see, so there's a positive correlation with repli re late replication timing. And then, as you might expect, you know, a negative correlation with expression. So genes that are expressed are under more, perhaps, negative selection to get mutated and so on. And so you could now start factoring in these types of trends that you see across all of these tumor types when you interpret individual mutations in a particular patient. What, you know, you're trying to separate out drivers from passengers, but you have to factor in the background rate, not just the background rate of the, of the patient's tumor, but of the gene itself and where it exists in the genome. And so I think we gain a lot of insight into these, uh, into these processes by looking at these tumors. 
And uh, Lee Ding's group at WashU could then um, publish a, a, a set of significantly mutated genes that I think is a good list to consult. If you're building a new mutation panel, you know, from AmpliSeq or something for your, for your, uh, 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 for a set, for a clinical trial, for example, you might want to consult this list for what genes we think are important in these solid tumors, at least. And uh, and then uh, the Barcelona group, led by Nuria um, uh, Vigas Lopez, could take um, many different methods, um, including you know uh, things like mutation assessor or CASM, like Rachel's group has developed, or um, other things to assess whether what, what's the impact of these mutations and build up a consensus on what we think are drivers versus passengers. And, um, and then have a nice list, a, a list of those things. And I think one of the take home messages here, this kind of shows you the frequency across the, the different tumors is many of these, um, these genes, like Will was mentioning, aren't, aren't mutated very frequently in any one particular tumor type. That's these stacks of different color, but as you put it together across the tumors, then the power starts increasing and we can really um, hopefully identify um, most of these driver genes. And um, the Lander group actually has a nice paper out, uh, I think about six months ago, where you know, they're arguing that we don't actually need to increase, to get at most of these infrequently mutated driver genes, you know, if we increase the amount of sequencing by not a huge amount, maybe tenfold more, we could actually start getting all of these driver genes, which I think is a, a major challenge of the immediate future to get these, um, these catalogs together. And then um, among all the other interesting trends, I like to show this one from Chris Sanders' group. They, they found what they call the, the cancer hyperbola, um, which, which is when they plot, in this, in this case, it's different tumor samples or the dots, and if you plot them together, you can see copy number alterations versus mutations. Um, you tend to see it's kind of mutually exclusive, so you can have a lot of copy number changes or a lot of mutations, um, but you can't, but these tumors don't seem like they can tolerate both. Um, and so why that might be is, um, it, it could be an interesting um, therapeutic way to leverage things. And they could define a new taxonomy based on this dominant piece of data, um, a piece of, uh, this trend of the data, and then first classify the M class, which are mutation driven, from the C class, which are the, uh, the, the uh, copy number driven, and then um, sort of refine on a theme from there to really try to get at a molecular classification of these tumors. Ben Raphael's group could take the, uh, the mutations, drape them on the background networks from uh, these protein-protein interaction networks, and then search them for themes. And one theme that was um, interesting that came out um, when they looked for these subnetworks is, uh, I think, a, a, more, a heightened appreciation for um, the chromatin remodeling set of genes that um, you know, either affect histone marks or um, um, play a role in, um, in silencing um, chromatin, and, and it seems like many of these tumors have these, have these changes. So this shows you all the just, you know, how many different tumor types have the, the alterations in this particular uh, chromatin remodeling group. You can see again, just like in the, in the plot before, the different colors of the tumor types that you would, you would be, it would be really rough to identify this in one tumor type by itself. You really need the power of, of, of the pan cancer analysis. So um, uh, 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 the consortium uh, led by Chris Benz, Chuck Peru, and myself um, had an opportunity to take all of this pan cancer data, and I'm just showing you the six major platforms we had, put it all together and try to define what's a, you know, how are you going to define subtypes with these data sets um, so that we can use it as a library, like I mentioned in the beginning, to consult uh, a particular patient's um, profile against, whether it be mRNA, microRNA, protein, and so on. So Katie Holdley and Chuck's group uh, was able to take sort of a clustering of all these things, and she has this analysis called Cluster of Clusters, um, the, and the, the assignments, we call the, them COCA. And so you just kind of cluster this matrix again, and there's some nice properties and maybe not some nice properties about how to do the clustering this way. Um, uh, um, we, but when you do it, you, t you basically get 13 different clusters out of the data, 11 of them are, are worth looking at. There's a couple that are kind of tiny. Um, we use 12 different tumor types. So you're thinking, oh, you got, you got about the same number of clusters as you got tumor types, right? Um, and sure enough, actually, when you look at this data, um, and we've clustered this on, on their own, um, uh, you, you tend to see um, that, the, that the individual clusterings from each of the different platforms 
tend to agree. So if we clustered them on their own, you, can, you tend to get the same type of clustering. Or, then, or if you do it together, you kind of get a refinement on that. And tissue, as maybe it wouldn't surprise folks, really dominates these, these subtypes. Um, another way to look at it is to kind of put this on a map. We have a, we've made a map now called the tumor map, where each sample is a hexagon. Um, in this grid and you lay it out with kind of force directed placement based on molecular similarity. I'm just sort of trying to zip to that. We test it out with breast cancer subtypes. It really worked nicely. The colors here show you those dominant transcriptionally based subtypes um, for, for, the, for the breast cancer um, based on Chuck Peru's um, PAM50 subtypes. So we could build this map um, for the pan cancer data set based on um, this, the integrated data and the colors now are the, are the tissues of origin. So you can see the, you know, the clusters are really cl colored uniformly, right? So again, the, the tissues are dominating these clusters. Now, if, you, if, if I summarize the results of this, most of the, the tumors, I, I would say 90% actually kind of map next to their tumor type of, the, their tissue type, right, by this clustering. So, you know, that's sort of the boring result, right? Um, but there's some exceptions, so um, I think we, we expected this from the TCJ study already, colon and rectum look very similar transcriptionally, and they kind of map together and, and are indistinguishable by these six platforms. Head and neck and lung, um, we heard a lot about head and neck squamous cancers. Those kind of map right in onto each other as well, the head and neck and the lung squamous tumors. And then I think one of the inter interesting cases so far, now of course this, this data set is still kind of small as far as the coverage of tissue types. The bladder cancers actually did show sort of a divergence and a convergence, if you will. Um, most of them kind of map on their own, but, but then um, there is a subset of the tumors that, that map to, uh, to lung adenos, and then there's another subset that map to the lung squamous, to the, to the head and neck lung and lung squamous um, area. I think another, another important finding here, too, is that the breast cancers um, on this grid of different tumor types, uh, the basal breast cancers really do map far away from, their, from, the, uh, from the luminals. And so they almost look like their own complete tissue type right, on this map. There are, there are distinct copy number differences that define these integrated clusters. And um, so we've mined some of that data. Um, Ben's group ran their hotnet algorithm, um, an updated version of it actually, so we could sort of delineate what are the mutational pathways that are, that are um, relevant for these different tumor types. And I, I showed one, but the chromatin remodelers sort of distinguish these squamous-like tumors, um, or you could look at the sort of an integrated set shared among many different tumor types. Each of the sort of the wedges in the pie show you um, what, what tissue types that we, um, which, I'm um, sorry, which integrated subtypes share these alterations. Um, so that's a nice one to consult. So even though uh, the minority of tumors map to, um, sorry about that, map to uh, a, you know, a different area and the majority map to just one-on-one -on -one where they're supposed to, um, we, we, we still found that there's prognostic information. Now it's, it's no surprise that, that t you, know, the, you know, if you get different cancers in different parts of the body, we already knew that there was differences in, in survival outcome, obviously. So tissue itself carries, you know, survival information. Um, uh, the, so the integrated clusters also do, obviously, but they're correlated with, with the tissue. So now you have to ask yourself, are, does it offer any other independent information? And in this, in this case, it does. So, um, you know, if you take the clinical information only, um, you still get, you get a boost when you add tissue information um, as far as predicting survival. And then if you add on to that the integrated subtypes, you're still gaining a, a, you know, a small amount because there's only 10% of the tumors mapping differently, but, but it is an important remapping of those tumors. And so when you look further into this, remember I told you the, the bladder cancers are the ones that diverge. So does it actually matter for the bladder cancers? So here's, here's actually where the bladder cancers go on that tumor map, right? They go to their own island and then they're going with the squamous, head and neck squamous group, and some go to the lung adeno group. Um, in fact, it does matter. Um, so that the, the bladder cancers that sort of mapped um, to the bladder only island in that previous graph have a better um, survival outcome than the ones that are mapping with the lung, and, uh, lung adenos and the head and neck squamous tumors. So uh, the, the, this integrated subtyping is carrying some information that's important. And we can look up then, um, you know, what, what distinguishes 
these um, squamous tumors and what's shared with the bladders, and you see things like 3P loss um, or telltale uh, mutations, again, in these chromatin remodelers that I mentioned earlier, um, that, that could be distinct targets for these, for, these, um, um, uh, for, the, for these folks that have bladder cancers that map sort of different than the other bladder cancers. So that leads me to, you know, what do you do? We heard all these cases um, uh, about patients that have particular um, you know, dizzy, uh, molecular profiles, and can we use maps like this now to, to develop treatment? Um, and so the first thing that you get into is, well, you know, with their distinct set of mutations, which ones are the passengers, which ones are the drivers? Can we figure out which ones look like um, gain of function, loss of function? Um, Will showed you a different categoriz categorization into four categories. You know, if it's not category one or two, what do you do about that? Um, and can pathway analysis tell you something? Um, so here's one particular example that you can do for, like, a, let's say it's a category one mutation where we know about the gene and we have pathway information. We look upstream of the pathway or downstream of the pathway in this case, and we see that it looks like it's dysfunctional. If you look upstream of the pathway and it looks like the regulators are really screamingly on uh, because of feedback circuitry, um, uh, then we can look, uh, you know, if we look at that on its own, we can compare the two um, pathway analyses and, and see this, this discrepancy between what you would infer from the upstream regulators from what you would infer from the targets, and um, we call this a shift score. Um, and then you can score some, some, of, the, um, some of these um, test cases for yourself. So here's retinoblastoma mutants in GBM. And um, the inference um, on the outside is, uh, is the shift between the logic of the upstream from the downstream analysis. And you can see that this would be predicted as, as a loss of function case. Um, kind of going quickly through here based on time. Um, or, you know, th for, a, for a, uh, an oncogene like um, NFE2L2, you would see a particular upregulation for the mutants. This time, th these are the patients that are mutated in NFE2L2. Each of these tick marks is a different patient. I forgot to mention that. So now you can go through a cohort and measure this shift score. And the point on this is that um, even though you have a low sample size for these mutations, right, this is kind of that long tail, um, you have some pretty big uh, uh, deviations from what you expect from the regulators, from what you're seeing downstream of the gene. You know, like for MET, like we heard about earlier, maybe these Maybe these patients um, should, you know, should be considered for co-targeting, like Christine was talking about. Um, uh, you can do this in the pan cancer sense. So we took all NFE2L2. There's, these are the mutants in NFE2L2, and you can see this is the tumor t tissue of origin here. Um, several tissues of origin have it, and they share this signature. Now, let's say you're going for a category three or four mutation, like Will was talking about. You don't know anything about it. You can just you first develop a machine learning model like this that recognizes NFE2L2 gain of function. And then what um, uh, my student did was mapped all events onto the uh, shift score. And you can see this other tick mark on the outside is the best correlated event of anything in the whole set of data we collected for TCJ. And that event happens to be keep one mutations. Uh, and that correlated the best with NFE2L2. So in this case, actually, we know KEEP1 is actually in the pathway with NFE2L2. They, con it's like they form a complex together. If you, and, and you can do kind of GSEA analysis and so on. So KEEP1 was the most positively correlated. CALL3 is the next one, and you can see that's also in the complex. So I think for when we have a hook into a, into a particular tumor type like NFE2L2, we can build our machine learning models and then fish out other, um, other events that are correlated with those uh, with those things we know about to start categorizing and expanding um, these, these, uh, these other unknown cases. Now, I have no idea what NPM1 is, but, I can, but it looks like it's mutually exclusive with, with NFE2L2 mutations, right? So that should help you kind of tease out what we think are the, maybe the important mutations from, from not. So if we go back to a patient and we sift through all the mutations we had, for this patient, we had like a P53 mutation, um, had some germline analysis on HER2, ERVB2, and, um, and, and then a NOTCH1 heterozygous mutation. So what do we do with this? And I'm going to end on this example. This is sort of a little bit, it's not fabricated, but we aren't acting on this yet, but just as sort of a teaser on what, what, where we might go with this type of data. So I mentioned in this dream team, we also have um, RNA-seq data. So we get some mutations from RNA-seq as well. 
but from, we, can, we can figure out what genes um, are upregulated or not in this patient's um, data set and try to remove any noisy genes by looking at what subtype from the mRNA data that patient maps onto. Um, and you can look at what themes might be, um, might be going on in that expression signature. But why, uh, the, the question is, why do we have uh, these mutations in the patient and do they have any relationship with the, the genes that, are, that are, have altered expression? Um, and so what you can do is you can do kind of master regulator analysis like Andrea Califano does to look for what transcription factor combinations describe the, the transcriptional profile you're seeing and maybe build up. And so these are the transcription factors that sort of describe these things. MIB is implicated. Um, we can see androgen receptors in there, so that's sort of a good positive check. But there's other, down, you know, other transcription factors that seem like maybe they're implicated um, in this particular um, patient's tumor. Um, but you still have a gap to fill. So how do you fill the gap from the mutations to those altered transcription factors? Um, uh, there are many methods to, to try to figure this out. One method that we published, uh, and I've listed some of the here from here, from, uh, you know, from like um, Joel Bader's group um, and, and, and um, Ben Raphael's group. Uh, we have a method where we try to take the mutations and we try to take the activated transcription factors and we put them on a network that we know about and then we use a, a double diffusion process to identify what's in between, like what helps link these together from what we know about, right? And so then we can try to fill in the holes. And so you might see a junk kinase, MAP K8 here might be implicated for targeting. And so one, maybe one way of getting this personal network for this patient that we started talking about in the beginning, um, you know, maybe you start thinking about trastuzumab because they have ERBB2, or maybe you start hitting some of these um, kinases that are implicated as um, really important for linking the mutated signature with the activated transcriptional profile that you see. That would be one way to do it. So we actually took this patient though, we mapped it on this, this um, integrated map and I think it's very interesting. So um, we had eight samples at the time and they all mapped kind of to this new prostate cancer land and that's sort of expected because uh, as I told you, tissue drives the clustering. Um, if you map this particular patient uh, with, and I showed you, it has, they have an ERBB2 germline mutation, but it, it turned out they also had a, 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 muta uh, a somatic uh, alteration as well. Um, they actually map into breast cancer land, island, and this is actually near the HER2 tumors. So transcriptionally, this, this patient does look like, you know, a HER2 breast cancer, which is sort of interesting. Um, uh, you know, whether the you know, clinicians will follow up on this or not and actually treat them with, with their HER2 inhibitors, I don't know. So um, I'll just summarize now and just say that, you know, for the N equal one case, I mean, what I've argued for here is take, you know, N equal infinity, if you can, of course, and build these libraries of signatures and then um, with as many, as much possible data as we can. I mean, we're blessed with TCGA that we have so much integrated data. Or, or develop trials like you saw with the basic study, um, all comers, and try to um, maximally be able to interpret what kind of um, subtype you have, and it may, be, it may be that the tissue is important or not. Um, uh, we need, obviously for the folks in the audience who are informatics developers, we need ways to assess which mutations we should care about. Um, uh, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of uh, uh, mileage to push on the pathway perspective. Um, and then how do we actually link together? I showed you um, sort of hand wavy arguments for trying to get a patient specific network by you know, figuring out why the, the genomic lesions that happen in a tumor led to the, um, all these other molecular phenotypic types of data like the transcriptional profiles that we see. And then um, I'm, I'm also involved in looking at all, you know, the quote rest of the genome. So what I, all the stuff I showed you basically is looking at the exomes and clearly some of the, you know, we want to um, investigate more of what's happening with the pathogens, like we saw with HPV and HBV. Uh, there's other pathogens that might be involved in, in, in these tumors and other regulatory elements that are affected and so on to get more of the dark matter charted out in these tumors. And so I'll just, I'll just end there. I, I, let me just race through this to my acknowledgments then. We're ready for the discussion. Okay. Yes. So Rachel says we're ready for the discussion section. Um, do you, are you going to introduce that, Rachel?